And so, you know, it's, it's one, of these, one of these slim meetings for us, and I apologize to, to Bill for that. Um, we have birthday cards going around, if you wouldn't mind signing. Um, Sarah Jones, our secretary, has a birthday coming up, and he made Edwards. And then there's a get well card for, for Bob Cabin, who's been a little under the weather lately. So we want to cheer him up with a card. Um, I also would like everybody to know that on Friday, July 28th, 10.30 at the UCC Church, there will be a memorial service for Bill Tubbs. Uh, passed away quite a few months ago, but um, her family will be here. And so 10 o'clock, UCC Church on Friday the 28th. And then also remind everybody, please support the fair. We have a wonderful fair here. Um, Jackson County Fair has been every year, I believe, since 1854, which is a very, very long time. And we've had a wonderful day. And so hopefully everybody, it's going to be a little more, it sounds like, but hopefully um, hopefully everybody can uh, take in the fair. And while you're there, please stop in the museums. It'll be free. Um, we have lots of cookbooks for sale at the museum, in case you missed them earlier. And um, the machine shed, there will be some special things going on in the machine shed. Mary Ward and Phil Gent are going to be crushing rock with a rock crusher that they restored. And there will just be a lot, of, a lot of neat things going on. So when you're at the fair, stop in, cool off, and uh, visit the museum. So um, I guess that's it for announcements, unless anybody has anything that they would like to add. To the list. And if not, I'd like to introduce our friend Bill Miller. He lives in DeWitt now, but he was a teacher. Um, still a teacher? Uh, part time. Part time teacher. 47th year, he tells me, in teaching. And he has worked with more than 8,000 students. And I already can tell he knows almost everybody here. Uh, teaches driver's ed part time. And we know, of course, that he's written two awesome books, and one of them he is here to talk about today. He's going to talk about Time to Ship Another Sphere. And I, took, I read it for the second time last night. He's got some wonderful stories. So if you haven't, if you haven't uh, read his book, see him. I'm sure he has a couple of copies with him. And so we, we want to welcome his son. is here from Texas, and that is Tyler. Tyler. Welcome, Tyler, and his wife, Ivy. So we're happy, happy to have you here. And you lived in Maquoketa most? We, for a couple years. I taught in Maquoketa for 31 right. years. Okay. We lived in Maquoketa a couple years. Audrey uh, was a special ed teacher in Duet, so that's how we ended up in Duet. So and in actually, we live across the road from Tycoga. Oh. The house, when you go by on the left by the grain elevator with the yellow doors, mm -hmm. that's our house. Okay, well, I'll be over. When Audrey, <laughs> when Audrey retired, she uh, painted the doors yellow to remind her how happy she was. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So, Bill, please. My topic today is time to ship another steer. It's a fun look at growing up on the family farm with ten brothers and sisters. Uh, I do know a few people here. Dave Jost, his son Bob is our son-in-law and we're good family friends. Uh, Jack has done, thankfully, I appreciate Jack has done endorsements for both of my books. I worked with Barb Mayberry for many years. Uh, Ramona uh, and her daughter Shirley. Ramona has been close, co close friends of ours for many years. So uh, just I'm happy to be here. And uh, how many of you wished you knew more about your grandparents? Can everybody hear me? Do I need to use the mic? How many, how many of you, can you hear or not? Okay, how many of you wish you knew more about your grandparents? Well, that's my big thing today, is trying to encourage everybody to uh, save those family stories for your grandkids. Uh, anybody that, uh, uh, you know, we all pretty much wish we knew more about our grandparents and you'll be doing, everybody would like to leave a legacy in life. Why not that legacy be uh, saving your family's history for uh, the generations to come? I had a couple, uh, this was the September before COVID. It was 
of 2019. A gal had read my book. Her and her husband were farm people, and they she came up to me after church one day with tears in her eyes and said, "You know, we had we have ten kids. We would love to save our story for our kids, and we don't know how to do it." So I sat down with her and her husband, and we uh, six sessions, and we put on audio. Ten and a half hours of one of the most incredible stories I have ever heard. And now they're ten kids, they're 23 grandkids, and their seven great grandkids all have grandma and grandpa's story. Uh, today I'm here, I'm here, I'm not used to working with the mic because I am pretty loud as Barb probably knows. Uh, uh, I'm here to make you laugh and to touch your heart. Uh, how many you know how sometimes children and their parents don't always communicate real well? Well, there, you might have heard the story about the little girl. She's seven, eight years old, and her mother is taking her to her friend's house to play. And on the way, she says, Mommy, how old are you? Well, that's kind of personal. Okay, well then tell me how much do you weigh? That's even more personal. So they get down the road a little bit farther, and she says, Well then, tell me, why did you and Daddy get a divorce? Okay, no more questions. So she gets to her little friend's house, and her friend says, no problem. Look at her driver's license. Everything you ever needed to know about your mother is on her driver's license. She gets home that night, and she says, Mommy, I know that you're 32. Amazing. And I know you weigh 130 pounds. How did you figure that out? And I know why you and Daddy got a, got a divorce. I'm sure you do. Why did Daddy and I get a divorce? You got an F in sex. <laughs> well, I taught eighth grade for 34 years, eighth grade, and I knew I had to have something safer and less stressful. So I became a driver's ed teacher. <laughs> Some people do extreme sports. I just get in the driver's ed car. Well, I retired from full-time teaching in 2010, and I shot off my mouth, I was going to write a book. Has anybody ever heard anybody say that, I'm going to write a book? So, nobody hears anything for four years. And one day I'm given blood at the uh, DeWitt High School, and next to me is Christine Gilroy. You guys know John. A lot of you, I'm sure, know John Gilroy. Uh, has been in business here for many years in Maquoketa. And so Christine's next to me. She's an award-winning writing teacher. And thankfully, she taught all three of our kids how to write. And I'm so appreciative of that. And so she says to me, she says, what are you doing? I says, well, I'm teaching driver's ed part-time, and I'm writing a book. And I said to Christine, I says, what are you doing? She had just retired the spring before. And I, she says, well, I'm substitute teaching, and I'm helping local authors publish their books. So have you ever heard the expression, when the, when the student is ready, the teacher will arrive? Well, that's exactly what happened. And she says, when you're finished, I'd be happy to take a look at it. It took me another year. It took, it took five years to collect 300 driving stories. And they are fun. People read the book and say, you know, I know these are true, but how can these stories be true? So I finished about a year later, and I was nervous because I was not, I don't ever remember getting in any A's in, in English class. And so I sent the story to her, and about 10 days later, she gets back to me, and she says, I love it. So we sat down, her and Audrey, my wife Audrey and I, so Audrey over here, and, with the, and we sat down and put together our first book. Uh, it's Come Drive With Me, The Adventures, Perils, and Insights of a driver's ed instructor. Uh, anybody that uh, is about 20% driving tips, everything I teach in the classroom and in, because I still teach part-time, in the classroom and in the car is in the book. It is a must read for any young driver and their parents. Also makes a great gift for young drivers. Uh, I am going to give you two or three uh, tips I'd like to share on driving before we move on to ship another steer. Uh, respect is the most important thing we have to have while driving. Okay, uh, anger, is, anger is the most 
uh, the number one emotion displayed by drivers on the highway. That's why you hear these stories about uh, road rage, and they are true. So when somebody's in a rage, stay away from them and be careful. We had a neighbor, uh, his name, uh, well, our neighbor lived behind us for 15 years. And he had 50 stock cows, he raised calves, and he also had a lawn service. Now, our neighbor did not believe, and still does not, does not believe in seatbelts, does not believe in mufflers, and he hates bicycles. Well, one day he's driving his, his truck, he was always pulling his, his trailer with either livestock or, or uh, lawn equipment in it, and you could always hear him coming down the road. One day he's driving south of DeWitt, and there's a man and a, head, and a man and a woman on their bikes ahead, so when he gets by them, he kind of nudges them off the road onto the shoulders, on their bikes. And then when he gets around them, he flips them off. Well, the very next day, he's driving down the same stretch of road, and he gets pulled over by the Clinton County Sheriff. And the sheriff says, uh, uh, he, he, he no seatbelt, no muffler, and he's missing the taillight. At that time, it was only $200 in fines. So he brings back the paperwork and he says to him, Hey, Ron, do you happen to remember yesterday you were driving down this stretch of road and you ran a man and a woman off the road on their bikes? Ron thinks, yeah, I think so. Do you also remember that after you put their lives in danger, you drove around them and you flipped them off? And, and, and Ron says, yeah, I think so. That was my wife and I. So, the lesson there is, don't ever, don't ever, don't ever flip somebody off. About three months later, I'm giving a talk for the Lions in DeWitt. And this little lady comes in, up, she's about 80, she's in her 80s. Many of you probably knew her, she worked for the Glad City Times. She was a world traveler. In fact, she endorsed my first book. So anyway, she uh, uh, comes up after the talk and she says, oh, it was so much fun. She says, it's the best we've had in ages. She says, but what does it mean to flip somebody off? <laughs> and what do you say? I, I said, well, ask your husband. I think he probably knows. <laughs> uh, cell phones. Cell phones are the number one cause of crashes in America today. It started out, people were talking on their phone. Then people were talking and texting. Now people are doing social media on their phones. The average look away is five seconds. At 55 miles an hour, you just went more than the length of a football field without looking at the road. And if you seriously injure somebody, you kill somebody while on your phone, it is the same as drunk driving. You will, if you kill somebody, you'll, you'll uh, spend the same amount of years in prison as if you had been drunk driving. So please put the phones away. Um, I had a, uh, for young drivers, my best piece of advice would be practice, practice, practice. According to State Farm Insurance, you are not experienced until you have a thousand hours of driving. So for anybody, if anybody, any of you have grandkids or anybody learning to drive, the goal for every family should be for that student to have several hundred hours of driving before they graduate from high school. I had one girl one time, 17 years old, and her sister was 19. Her sister had already had five crashes at 19. And this girl was a passenger, four out of the five. And she was 17. And I said to her, I said, do you really think it's such a good idea for you to be riding with your sister. She said, well, I know she's a horrible driver, but you would never hurt me. Yeah. <laughs> um, my second book is Time to Ship Another Steer. And I was Ted sharing this with Christine, and we were going to call the book something else, and she says, you know, Time to Ship Another Steer, that would be a great title. And what it is, when you have 11 kids on the farm at home, and there's a bill to pay, it's time to ship another steer. So that's where that came from. Uh, anybody from a big family, anybody that has any farm experience, anybody that spent time on the farm as a kid, and your aunt and uncles on your own home, for your grandparents, uh, a relative, you are going to love this book. Anybody that likes history, anybody that would like to learn more about what life was like on the farm in a big family in the mid-1900s. 
they make great gifts to books too. Uh, I, I continue to teach part-time. I write books and I tell stories. I would like to thank my wife Audrey. Audrey has been proofing my work since college. Okay, and today she's not quite so anxious to prove my work anymore. I don't know if she's just tired of it or if I've become a better writer. I'm not sure. But uh, and then I'd also Audrey is an artist, a poet, and uh, and a photographer. Audrey in my first book, Audrey, one two three. Okay. Uh, in my first book, Audrey did all the cartoons, and it's really fun. it's really fun. And then the second book, Time to Ship Another Steer, this is a, a painting of our farm. And our house is uh, over 170 years old. And my brother lives in it today. I'd also like to thank Christine Gilroy. How many people here know Christine Gilroy, John's wife? Uh, Christine has been awesome. She uh, has helped, she has edited and helped publish over 30, over 30 books for local authors. And uh, she is just, she is just awesome. And I just can't thank uh, her and Audrey enough because when we went to press, when we thought that you had a book done, there were only a hundred steps you didn't know about. Uh, when we get all done today, uh, I'd be happy to sign books. With tax, both books are $16. And then Audrey, Audrey published her first book a year ago, Take a, Take a Visual Walk. It's a children's book. It's one of Audrey's poems and her photography. And what is really neat is you look at the book and you, you see how children, when young children are out, how they study everything. They're always learning. They're always wanting to, uh, to, to, to learn. In fact, just a funny thing, about a week ago, we happened to be at my daughter's, and my, my, one, my youngest grandson, he's four, and we're watching this TV show about nature, and it's about albatrosses and sharks. And so we're watching these albatrosses innocently floating on top of the water, and these huge, giant sharks would come up and swallows, swallow the albatross. Well, after about five or six of these, my grandson, four years old, he says, can't they see them coming? <laughs> but kids are just so much fun. Little kids are, in fact, I tell people, if I'd have known how much fun the uh, grandkids were going to be, I'd have been a lot nicer to Tyler and his sisters. <laughs> um, Audrey's book sells for 11. Please take a look at her book. I think you're going to really, really enjoy it. Well, my, my, my father's father, Peter Miller, it's pronounced Miller, uh, he came over, he, he, was, he was almost 50 years old when my dad was born. My dad was on the tail end of the family of nine. And uh, Peter, come, he got drafted into the German army. He, he was from uh, uh, right next to the Belgian border. And he was drafted, I think it might have been the Prussian army, 1890, 21 years old. You have to go into the army for a year. So they have his going away party. He hops on a ship and comes to America. And he spent his life, he was a farmer, and he, tra he sold and trained uh, two or three draft horse teams every year. This was his life. He loved America because he could farm with draft horses. In Germany, all they had were oxen. Uh, my grandmother, Mary Miller, later became Miller, she was uh, Mary Maud McFarland. She was born in 1876 in the 100th birthday of America. She, if she would have lived another year and a half, she would have died in the bicentennial. And she used to share stories about her father who fought, this was my great grandfather, who fought in the Civil War. And my grandmother came from what today we call a dysfunctional family. So she was married at 17 or 18. She married a man that was 20 years older than her. And he died of tuberculosis after having two little boys. My grandmother was a widow with two little boys by the time she was 21 years old. And she lived, uh, this is where our family farm is. It's on Highway 31 uh, between Racine and Kenosha counties where I grew up. 
And she used to walk up and down the highway all the time with these two little boys in tow, and she'd do housekeeping, cleaning, cooking, whatever she could to support these two little boys. And one day my grandfather came out, him and his brother both came from Germany, they were both bachelors. He comes out and he says to my grandma, would you be willing to be our housekeeper, it'll be free room and board for you and your two little boys, and we will pay you four dollars a week. And so she spent, she always used to kid that they got behind in their pay, so they decided one of them should marry her. So she married my, my grandpa Peter, and they had seven more kids, and then she raised two of her grandkids. My mom's father, George Thomas, uh, my mom grew up two miles from where my dad was, but they were three and a half years in age, so they never knew each other, but yet, how many people here have ever played the German card game Sheepset or Shaska? One, you go down by Calamus, there's a lot of Sheepset. Well, my mom taught it, my two grandfathers both played Sheepset together, and, but my mom and dad didn't meet each other until uh, just before my dad got drafted. But my grandfather, George, was a, he was a town clerk for 30 years, and he had a small farm. They used to raise three acres of strawberries, and they used to take them down to Chicago because they're only about an hour and a half north of Chicago, this is Kenosha, Wisconsin. And, but my grandfather was a great baseball player, and his father was a second generation farmer. His father hated baseball. And when his father died, my great-grandfather died, in his papers they found a letter from the Chicago Cubs inviting my grandfather to come and try out. He never got the letter. And you think how sad that was. But had he gotten the letter, guess what? We wouldn't be here having this talk today. Uh, so uh, Grandpa got, he was married, he had four little kids, he had four kids, his wife died. He was a widower for five years. According to my mother, he only dated my grandmother maybe twice. They got married and they had 11 more. He was 13 years older than my grandmother. And so they had 11 more. The first one died as a baby. And then my mother was the first of the last 10. So they ended up, they raised to adulthood 14 kids. Uh, my mother, my grandmother, uh, she ended up. She ended up with about uh, 65 grandkids, and her husband, my grandpa, he died at 60 with colon cancer, 1942 during the war. And so my my grandmother still had. She was a widow with nine kids still at home. And so by the time most of her grandkids, 65 grandkids came along, grandma was tired. <laughs> uh, mom and dad, dad and mom were were children of the depression. Dad was the youngest boy. He was number eight. He said he grew up feeling like he had, and during the Depression, most of his older brothers were still at home, so he felt like he grew up with five fathers telling tell him what to do all the time. Grandma wanted one of her kids to go to high school. So my dad spent four years hitching and, and finding a ride to and from school eight miles each way so that Grandma could have a son with a high school diploma. He graduated at 17, and him and a buddy, without telling anybody, they hopped on the train and took it to California. They were gone four months. And he, he, my dad spent his eight, I think about the kids today, 17. My dad left at 17. He spent his 17th birthday on a boxcar in the state of Washington. He comes home four months later looking pretty ragged. Uh, scraggly beard, his clothes are kind of ratty. He comes walking up to the farm and the dog sees him and doesn't recognize him, starts growling at him. And he says to the dog, he says, hey Scotty, how you doing buddy? The dog recognized him and went nuts. His best friend in the whole world was over. Uh, so then he has to walk up to the house to see what kind of reception he's going to get. Well at this point, his father is 67 years old. His father gave him a hug. It was the first time in his life he had ever been hugged by his father. My mom was the oldest of the last 10. She was the matriarch of the family for 45 years. Now, mom and dad had just met just before dad got drafted. They had just a few dates. 
and mom and dad's court one their entire courtship was four and a half years through the mail because dad was gone for four and a half years during World, World War II. He was up in the Aleutian Islands, up by Russia. He never saw a woman or never came home for three and a half years. So they come home. The war, the war ends in August of 45. They get married June 1st of 46. My oldest brother, Tom, the first of 11, is born in September of 47. Mom was 25 years old when she had her first child. And at one point, there were seven of us under the age of eight. And people say, do you remember their order, when their birthdays are, and how old they are? Yes. It's Tom, Mike, Mary Ellen, Bill, Mark, Jane, Steve, Tim, Donna, Val. I hope you got that because we are going to quiz you today. Uh, when number 11, Beth was ready to be born, this was uh, uh, just a few days before, Dad was always working. And, but on Saturdays, we boys would always work with Daddy. Uh, he tried to pick up something he shouldn't. He, hurt, he injured his back. So Dad is in the hospital, and it's time for Mom to have number 11. So she calls my brother Mike. He's the second oldest. He's, a he's at the junior-senior prom. He's the second oldest. And so he comes rushing home, picks her up, takes her up to the hospital. And here he is in the maternity ward, and he's in a tuxedo, and he's got his boot in air. And, and people are probably thinking, boy, this is kind of, kind of close. <laughs> so he's in his tuxedo, and, and one of the fathers looks at him, and he says, uh, he says to him, he says, is this your first? And Mike, at the time, he was a junior in high school. He was 17 years old. He's, she, he says, is this your first? No, this is number 11. <laughs> one time, one time dad, dad was in his 80s. He's got a doctor's appointment. And it's a new doctor, and she looks at his chart, and she sees that mom and dad had had 11 kids. And mom was with dad that day, and obviously this doctor was not a Catholic. She, so my dad is in his 80s, and she starts scolding him for having such, uh, uh, such a big family. Why didn't you use birth control? Well, my mother, you had to know her, she was a hoot, she was so much fun. My mother leans over to the doctor and says, we did use birth control. That's why we only had 11. <laughs> well, in our family, uh, we were taught the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and to whom much is given, much is required. We lived on Highway 31. It was the major highway between Racine and Kenosha. We always had, not only did we have company, we used to have people in the middle of the night, they'd run out of gas, the car would break down, they'd, they'd slide in the snow into the ditch, they'd have a flat tire. We always had people come to the door. And mom and dad always had a lot of company. Even in the old days, they both died at home, they were both sharp to the very end, so we were blessed. But mom and dad always had a lot of company because everyone that came to their door knew that they were loved and they felt like family. Uh, mom, just, mom and dad decided to give us all a Catholic education. And so you think, well, how the heck do you do that? And mom says, well, the nuns are going to teach us and are going to make us behave. Well, the formula must have worked because all 11 of us have a college degree. But uh, mom, uh, uh, so how do you put, how do you raise a family? You're paying that for that education. Our family has four sources of income. Dad had a day job. He uh, he farmed. We used to custom bale and hay all over Racine and Kenosha, and we uh, we had a ten-acre garden. We sold them. We sold fruit and vegetables all summer and fall, and that's how we were able to make it happen. And, and like I said, Dad worked all the time. Dad's day job. He started out in the foundry, and after about ten years, the doctor says. If you want to live to see your grandkids, get out of the foundry. So then he went to work for American Motors. They made cars in Kenosha. And he was there almost 10 years, and they went on strike. Well, at the time, Dad had nine kids at home. So he started working construction. He became a spent finisher. And uh, he, uh, uh, that's, he was in construction the rest of his career. In fact, my dad was so active, he lived to be 99. But at 85, he had to quit splitting firewood because he used to have problems with vertigo. And then at 95, he had to quit mowing the four acres of grass 
He had a, a zero radius mower. He had to quit mowing the grass because the vertigo gave him too much trouble. <laughs> but uh, our, our farm was only 96 acres. But if you think about it, back around World War II, that was the size of a farm. And uh, we, our, our main number one piece of equipment on the farm was a Farmall H. How many people remember the H? Most popular tractor ever sold was an H. In fact, we used that tractor for 75 years for almost all of our, our hay rides. Uh, Mark and I, I, was, I had trouble in school when I was little. I couldn't read, I was horrible in sports. And so I, because I couldn't read, finally, First grade, they let me go because I was so cute. Second grade, they were a little bit more hesitant, but they made me go to summer school, and that didn't help. The only thing I, I figured out there was how to avoid the bully who beat me up at, at, during, uh, on the playground. Mm -hmm. And then after third grade, I flunked. So, best thing ever happened, because my brother Mark and I, Mark's a year younger, we were classmates for the next 10 years. Uh, we, uh, Dad quit milk, got rid of his herd when, he, when I was three years old. He bought a Guernsey cow, you know, the, the red and white cows. Her name was Pinky. We had her for about, about 10 years. And then after her, we had her daughter, Rosie, for another 10 years. And Mark and I were 9 and 10 years old when we learned how to milk the cow. Now, Dad would milk before, before work. Mark and I would milk in the evenings, weekends, and during the summertime. Now, Dad... Uh, a Guernsey, if you take good care of in the summertime, they're going to give over four gallons of milk a day. Well, Dad could milk two gallons of milk in two to three minutes. There'd be this much foam on the pail. Now, Mark and I, we had little kids don't have any hand strength, and we'd be forever. And then after about a half hour, the cow would start getting nervous. How many people in here have ever milked a cow? Okay, quite a few. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about, especially when you're little. And the cow, she'd get nervous, she'd start moving around, and she'd smack you in the face with her dirty tail. And what she was really telling you was, either you hurry up, or I'm going to kick the pail over. <laughs> and, and Mom used to get so upset when we'd come to the house with an empty bucket, because sometimes her milk customers would actually be at the house waiting for the milk. But the good thing that came out of that, Mark and I both went on to become really good wrestlers. In fact, uh, we never had a decent car, so our senior year, I hitchhiked from Lake Michigan to Dubuque to Loris College. I wrestled there for four years, but I hitchhiked to Dubuque uh, for my college visit because we never had any decent, never had any good transportation. Uh, we, we bailed hay and straw all over Racine and Kenosha. We, our one summer, because Dad was always at work, one summer, our two oldest crew members were my brothers Mike and Tom, ages 12 and 13. But if you guys remember when you were young, that's the kind of work that young boys did. And uh, we, uh, Mark and I, we had a baler, an old Roanoke baler. And every fifth or sixth bale didn't tie. So Mark and I, we started at ages six and seven every, for several summers. We'd ride on the baler on the, the twine compartment. And every bale that didn't tie, we would tie a square knot. And it, it was dirty, it was, it was loud, but it was great because we're right in the middle of the action and we didn't have to work that hard. And today, neither Mark nor I can hear. <laughs> we, uh, the, uh, our garden was 10 acres. Our main crop was sweet corn. We used to have six to eight plantings. We had five acres of sweet corn every year. We'd have fresh sweet corn from the middle of July until after Labor Day. Mom, at six years old, Mom would give us a gunny sack, take us to the patch, and depending how big we were, she'd put so many ears of corn in the bag, we'd drag it to the end of the row, dump it into the back of the Rambler station wagon. And uh, that, like I said, that was our main crop. We'd have, we had, we'd have five acres every year, at least five acres. And uh, we, one summer, Mom decided, 1959, I was six years old, Mom decided to sell to one of the grocery stores in Racine. We got up early, had to have the corn to Racine by 7 a.m. when the store opened. That summer, Mom was paid a half a cent, an ear for our sweet corn. Half a cent. 
1959. When we sold it on the roadside, we got retail. We got 25 cents for a baker's dozen. Uh, our next biggest crop was uh, raspberries. We used to pick and sell over a thousand pints of raspberries every year. We used to have, we had an orchard. We sold a lot of apples. We'd sell two to three hundred gallons of apple cider every year. We used to plant 1,500 melon hills by hand. By hand. We picked melons by the pickup load. In later years, Dad used to plant a thousand tomato plants. And that's what we did for a minute. And that's what, what we did to supplement the family income. Now, take that, think about that type of farming. In contrast, that Audrey grew up on a big dairy farm in Jamesville. Janesville, if you're not sure, that's 60 miles on Highway 11, goes from Dubuque all the way over to Lake Michigan. I grew up two miles south of 11, and 60 miles to the west, Janesville, Wisconsin, where her family farm was, and that's about 100 miles east of Dubuque, Janesville. So, and her family, they had 80 milk cows, they had 6,000 laying hens, and they raised a lot of hogs. Audrey was in the barn at 4.30 in the morning every day of her life until she went away to college to escape. <laughs> she went to UW, uh, went to UW Platteville, met my sister, the best of friends. My sister finds out we're dating and says, be careful of Bill. <laughs> so, and then Audrey also, when she went away to college, she vowed never to marry a farmer. Uh, our house, as I mentioned, is 170 years old. Between my grandparents and my parents, they they raised 22 kids in that house, one bathroom. Uh, doctor visits were pretty common, usually for stitches and tetanus shots. How many people here have ever had a tetanus shot? Okay, they could never, back then, they could never ever remember when the last one was. So sure enough, you'd have to get one every time. And it's kind of like today, you know, when you go to the doctor, they can't remember who you are or when your birthday is, so they ask you six times. That's kind of what it was like back then. We had all the diseases, mumps, chicken pox, measles, German measles. One would get sick, everybody gets sick. Uh, we used to get our tonsils out in groups. I guess, I guess it was, must have been cheaper that way. Um, Sunday, mass, Sunday mass was uh, the most important event of the week. We come home from Sunday Mass on, on, in nice weather, and Mom would always dress us up real nice. And we'd come home, and she'd line us up. We call them the lineup pictures. She'd line us up in front of the in front of the house, and it was always oldest to youngest. Then she'd take her picture. So it was Tom, Mike, Mary Ellen, all the way down to whoever the little one happened to be at the time. We can look at those pictures 60 years later and tell you what year that picture was taken based on who the little one is on the end and how old they are. Now, unfortunately, we've got a bunch of those pictures, but we didn't put any in the book because by the time Donna and Beth came along, Donna was five, she was the second young, Donna and Beth, two youngest, Donna was five years younger than Tim, so by the time they came along, my two oldest brothers were pretty much gone. So we, unfortunately, we didn't get to put in, we didn't think it would be right to put a family photograph in with two of the kids missing. So, now, had it been my two brothers missing, we most of them probably wouldn't have minded. Uh, Mom taught us how to play. We played a lot of board games. We played a lot of cards. She taught us all how to play the game 500, similar, similar to Duker. Once we mastered that, we all learned. She taught us all how to play sheep's head. Today, most of us still play sheep's head. In fact, at the farm, one Saturday a month, we still play. So, if next time you're in Kenosha, you want to play sheep head, just let us know. You're welcome to come and join us. Outdoors, we played a lot of ball. You know, not only us, but friends, uh, neighbors, cousins would come over. We had a, we played ball a lot in the summertime. Uh, in the barn, our barn, our woods, and our creek was our playground. Even, even in the coldest weather, Mom would chew us out of the house. And Dad would get so upset. One summer, one, one winter, we, Mark and I had six forts built in the barn, all connected by tunnels. And, and Dad would think he had a barn full of hay. He'd pull a bale out, there would be a cabin. Um, uh, we had an old Boy Scout cabin in the woods that we uh, spent a lot of time uh, in. Uh, we used to play in the creek. Back then, all the farms used to dump into the creek. Oh, so 
uh, that it, the water was so polluted, there weren't any, even any minnows in the creek. And boy, mom, would, she would get upset when we would uh, come from the creek and she knew we had been swimming in the creek. Um, one time, mom was painting the picnic table in the backyard. Back then, it was oil-based. You guys have worked with oil-based paint, how much fun that is. Well, she's painting, and Tom and Mike are four and five years old. And they plead with mom, can we please help you? Finally, she gives them, gives them each a paintbrush. They're about halfway done with the project, and the phone rings. So mom runs in, gets it. She comes out two, three minutes later, and two-year-old Mary was picnic table green. Mom said that was the maddest she had ever been in her whole life. And but there were no long fat, long long term effects on Mary because she turned out to be the smartest one in the whole family. Uh, about three months later, it's September. At this point, Tom had turned six, and he's in first grade. And we had the neighbor kid, Eddie Haskell. Have you ever heard of Eddie Haskell? You remember Leave It to Beaver? Well, Eddie lived across the street from us, and he was about eight or nine. We'll call him Eddie. He was about eight or nine years old. He was always coming over, getting Tom and Mike in trouble. Well, for some reason, Tom's at school this day, and Eddie comes over, and him and Mike sneak into Mom and Dad's bedroom, get his 16-gauge shotgun, and then they go to the milk house, they go to the top shelf, get the shelves, load the gun, and Mike is four years old. They go to the cow barn. Thankfully, Mary can't open the door, and so they're in the cow barn. Pretty soon, an explosion, and Mary goes screaming to Mom, Mom and heard the gunshot, and Eddie... Uh, realizes what he had caused, so he runs out the back door and runs home. And Mom comes running into the barn, and here is four-year-old Mike laying on the concrete unconscious. She thought her little boy had died and gone to heaven. Well, what had happened was the recoil of the gun had knocked the back of his head on the concrete. I'm happy to say Mike just turned 74. <laughs> Uh, winter time, we did a lot of sledding, a lot of tobogganing. My my grandmother, my mom only grew up two miles from my dad, and so my grandmother was still on the farm. And we go across the road, did a lot of sledding, a lot of tobogganing, and we get cold. Then we go to grandma's for cookies before we went home. We did a lot of skating. Uh, mom would, uh, she would take us. The neighbor had a pond. It was almost a half a mile. She'd take us, drop us all off, and then when we got cold, we were supposed to walk home. Well, the little ones always got cold first. So before we would leave for home, the little ones would have hand, frozen hands, frozen feet. And then they would go numb on the way home, and we had no feeling. And mom, we get home, mom used to take and stick our hands and feet in ice water to bring them back. And uh, we played a lot of hockey. We uh, just... Mom, again, she'd do about anything to get us out of the house. Played a lot of hockey, and then Mark and I, when we were in middle school, we used to go down to, we had a creek running through our farm, we'd go down to the creek, we'd skate a couple miles to the north, Highway 11 is where we'd turn around, and then we'd skate down to Petterfine Springs Park, and if you know anything about running water, it had to be free, it had to be zero for a week before it was safe, and I did see one buddy one time fall in. Fortunately, it was only waist deep. But uh, we would, uh, and, and think about this today, it's 10 below zero, your 11, 12, or 13 year old grandchild has been gone for three or four hours. Would you get a little nervous? Well, that's what we did back then as kids. That's how, that's how, you, lived, that's how you lived your life. Um, outings were big. We never, never took vacations. How do you do that? But mom would take us somewhere every single week We'd go to Lake Michigan, we'd swim in the lake. We'd go to Paddock Lake, we'd go to uh, Browns Lake. We're only half mile, half hour south of Milwaukee. We'd go to the Milwaukee Zoo every summer. We would go to the state fair in Milwaukee on family discount day every year. She just, uh, outing to so she just knew we needed to experience stuff. She made us all learn how to swim. Mom was a great ball player herself. You remember the, the movie, A League of Their Own, with Tom Hanks? Yes. My mother tried, they had teams on Racine, Kenosha, Beloit, Rockford. My mother tried out. She went down to Chicago and tried out. She didn't end up playing for them, but, uh, but she was a tremendous athlete, but never learned to swim. So she insisted we all learn how to swim. Every summer we took swim lessons. And you know, because she insisted, we learned to swim. There's probably 120 in our family, in our immediate family today. And uh, 
we have spent thousands of hours being able to enjoy water because mom insisted we all learn how to swim. Uh, birthdays were big. On our birthdays, we were treated like a king or a queen. That's, that was so important to my mother. Holidays, uh, Halloween, Thanksgiving, uh, Christmas, Easter, Mom always did those up big. Mark and I, we used to uh, trick or treat all over the countryside. We'd come home with big bags of candy, and the only time we ever had candy at home was Halloween and Easter. And Easter, uh, we used to have this tradition, I don't know if you guys, any of you had this, we had this tradition where they'd hide baskets the night before, they'd ask you, and they could hide it anywhere on the farm. And they'd ask the night before, how do you want your basket hit? Medium, difficult, impossible. <laughs> we'd come home from church on Sunday, spend hours, hours looking for, and then this is how we, we would always find them. You're getting warmer, you're getting warmer. Okay, and why Mark and I ever spent so much time trying to hoard this candy because our two oldest brothers, Tom and Mike, would talk us into playing a game of dice and they'd take all our candy away from us. <laughs> well, in October of 1971, Mark and I were both seniors in high school. In October, Mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. She had surgery and two months later, Mark and I, as it turned out, both became very good wrestlers. And uh, three days before Christmas, we had a home wrestling meet, and it's all talked about in the book. But Mark was dropped on his head, and he broke his neck. And he walked out of the hospital eight weeks later, and the doctors and the nurses said they, didn't, they couldn't explain why he ever survived. That's how bad the break was. Mm -hmm. However, I'll also say, I wrestled in high school, I wrestled in college, I coached for 13 years, I have been a wrestling fan my whole life, and that is the only serious neck injury that I have ever witnessed. And Mark is doing, still doing great today. Uh, Mom, so after those two events, Mom's cancer, Mark's broken neck, it changed our, our family forever. And our family today is still really, really close. Mom lived another 45 years. And I think the way that she, what was on her mind was every day, she was the most fun person I've ever known. And she, every day, she looked at it as a gift from God that maybe she shouldn't have had. And so mom and dad were, were uh, married 70 years. And mom, they had their, in 2016, June 1st, we celebrated 70 years. Short time later, she had been having some health issues. She went into the hospital, and then when she came out, she was on hospice until she died the following January of 2017. Mom, and, and then, uh, mom, so mom was almost 95. Both mom and dad were sharp to the end, to the very end. And they both died at home. Mom was almost 95 in January, and then dad passed in October. He, he, he uh, was buried on his 99th birthday. So our family just feels uh, just so blessed that we had mom and dad as long as we did, and I spent years pumping for information. Uh, last story Last story I'd like to share. I was doing this talk in uh, Tipton. This was uh, the summer 2019, and uh, I'm doing this talk, and afterward, a guy comes up to me. He's a farmer. He's about 10 years younger than me, and, he, and this was the year before the derecho, but a, a, a wind had destroyed their barn, and they, they couldn't salvage it, so they had to tear it down. And he says, you know, he said, it, it really bothered me having to tear down all those memories. So they tear down the barn. I give the talk. He buys my book. Well, I happened to run into him in Dubuque in February. Loris College, where I wrestled and went to school, uh, was hosting the regional wrestling meet to qualify for the Division Three Nationals. Well, his son was there. He wrestled for Cole. And he came up to me and says, you know, he says, I read your book. And he said, I started reading the stories about the, about the barn. And he said it had such an impact on me, I cried. And what I want to ask everybody, and I hope everybody in this room will be that person in your family that will leave that, that legacy, that will leave that family story for your brothers and sisters, or for your grandkids, and your great grandkids, so that someday, someday, your grandkids, your great grandkids, will, are going to be able to say, "I know them and thank them."
Anybody has any questions? Uh, if anybody's interested in saving their stories, uh, if you got any questions, maybe I can help you out with that. But I'd be happy to answer any questions they may have. Do you have some books for sale? We do. Uh, both my books and Audrey's are available. We'll personally sign them. Yes? I have kind of a weird question. Didn't any of your kids, any of the kids, stick their tongue on the pump during the winter? <laughs> Get there. I do know we're going have my feet and my hands stuck in ice cream. But mom, it didn't matter how cold it was, she'd set us on. Yeah. But back then, that's how they did it. Sure. I think everybody stuck their tongue in the pump. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll, we'll take a seat over here if anybody would like to purchase. And uh, you know what? If you guys are thinking about saving your family stories, there's a lot of ways to do it. Also, Christine, if you guys know anybody that's ever run a school yearbook, they can publish your book for you. I'd like to point out that my family 